Hello. Welcome to Introduction to Philosophy. My name is Grant Yoakum. Um, I'm going to be your instructor, and the purpose of this video is to discuss the course syllabus, which was posted to Moodle. So, um, uh, basically, I'm going to take you through what it uh, means to be doing this course, what's expected to you, the assignments, the discussion forums, um, the course policies, um, uh, some notes about assessment um, and uh, academic integrity, and sort of a very quick overview of what we'll be studying this semester. So, um, this is your first video lecture. I've emailed this to you, um, but it's also posted to Moodle. Going forward, um, you will be logging into Moodle. I will be posting things to Moodle, and um, it's going to be your responsibility to stay up to date and uh, make sure that you know what's going on with the course. Um, I've laid out um, the syllabus, hopefully in a very intuitive, very clear kind of way. Um, it is five pages long. Um, uh, the first has a lot of boilerplate about the course, which we'll discuss. List the text, um, and, and course description, and the grade breakdown, which I've got behind me on the chalkboard here. Um, the second page uh, discusses uh, policies and evaluation, uh, which carries over onto the third page. Um, uh, list, uh, third page lists instructional technology uh, used in the course. Everything's through Moodle, so if you log on to Moodle, uh, you should be able to click your way through absolutely everything in the course. And I've listed um, all of the important dates on page three as well. Um, page four, um, if you're gonna print anything from this syllabus, I would print page four and just keep a copy right by your desk. Um, I'm going to be doing the same here, um, just so that you know this is the tentative schedule. I call it a tentative schedule because things happen. Um, we, we, the, the university IT technology might go down. Um, life happens. Right? Um, I'm the father of twin girls um, uh, who are two and a half years old, one of whom has very frequent sort of uh, medical needs. So uh, it frequently puts me in a different city and away from my desk. Um, uh, I, I will do absolutely everything in my power to mitigate that, and um, thanks to portable technology, um, it generally I'm able to stay right on top of everything with regard to the course, but um, if we wind up in a case where we've got emergency heart surgery or something along those lines, I think you'll understand um, if uh, this schedule has to be adjusted. But nonetheless, um, this is the plan. Um, I think there's plenty of time to engage with everything in the course as part of this plan. So um, hopefully it will lay everything right out for you, um, including Thanksgiving recess. Um, uh, so everybody gra grab your toque and your scarf. I love the term recess for it. Uh, go out into the playground. Anyhow, um, it's we've got uh, week 12 of the course um, off. All right, so all of your dates are listed there, um, including your assignment deadlines, including when I'm going to post your assignments to Moodle. Um, so you will have a chance to, um, to, 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 to engage with those. I give you lots of time with these, these assignments, but they are involved. Now, um, the final page of the syllabus that we'll go over um, is the grading scheme, which you should take a close look at because it's different um, from what you're used to. Um, my percentage point to letter grade um, uh, conversion is uh, to you unique. Uh, for me, it's just what I grew up with. Um, it's, it, largely, it's arbitrary kind of thing. An A is still an A, a B is still a B, a C is still a C. Um, and to demonstrate that, in addition to my percentage point to letter grade conversion, I um, list the official from the Oakland University Office of the Registrar letter grade to GPA conversion um, chart, right? And all the Office of the Registrar ever sees for me is the GPA. So if you get an A, like let's say a straight A on the high range of the A, so let's say you get a 90 or a 91 in the course, that's going to be a 3.9. Right. Let's say you get a 78 in the course, that's a B plus, and a B plus is still a 3.5, etc., etc., etc. 
right? So your letter grade is your grade. And I supply this just so you don't freak out when I give you a numerical grade. And so, um, it, nonetheless, right? um, so I suppose I'll start off with a couple of things about me. Um, I hold a PhD in uh, philosophy and interdisciplinary humanities, um, uh, which I've sort of recently completed less than a year ago. Um, I've been teaching at Oakland University for, this is closing off my 13th year. I started in um, uh, 12th year, 13th year, long time anyway. Um, I started in January 2005. Um, teaching for Oakland University, which seems like a long, long time ago. Um, mostly what I teach is introductory courses. Sometimes they give me an upper level course as well, but nonetheless, um, I am in the trenches doing the introductory courses, which um, frankly I love. And, uh, introductory courses are laid out in an interesting kind of way and it allows me to do something dynamic and hopefully interesting to you with them. Um, so, uh, I also hold a Master's in Philosophy, um, also from Brock University from a long, 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 long time ago. Uh, I graduated in 2003, and my undergraduate degrees, I have two of them, one in English and the other one in, is in Honors in Philosophy. So, um, it's, it, I've got lots and lots of training. Um, in fact, I've been in teaching support uh, since the, the mid-90s. So, um, it's not like I just fell off the, uh, the turnip truck. Uh, the other thing to uh, know about me is um, I'm actually sitting in Canada right now. Um, I'm, I'm a Windsor, I live in Windsor, and I've been commuting internationally to do this job, um, like, like I say, for a long time now. Um, uh, which has worked out in a lot of ways um, and has been stressful in a lot of other ways. You're an online class, so um, uh, the trouble with commuting is uh, not going to be a problem that affects you. That's is part of the reason why I like teaching an online class. I get to be very reliable with regard to an online class, um, whereas every now and again on my commutes, um, the Department of Homeland Security would like a word with me, and how long that takes is anybody's guess. So. Um, I build things into my day to make that very, very, very um, manageable and give myself lots of time to get to class, what have you. Um, now, I am here uh, to help you. And so, um, if you run into problems, if you don't understand something that's going on with the course, if you're confused, or if you just need a pep talk, um, please contact me. Uh, email is uh, probably going to be the, 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 the way that most of you contact me. And so it's, I fully acknowledge that. And I list my email address on the course syllabus on page one and right here. And if you're looking for me, I have a faculty page uh, through the Department of Web's, uh, 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 Philosophy's website as well. So um, if you need to contact me, there are plenty of ways to contact me. Um, but the best way to um, get advice um, about the course is, let's face it, it's better if we meet in person. Um, so I have an office on campus that's a shared office with a few other people. It is in MSC 642, it's sort of up at the tower and at the end of the hallway. We've got a window, so that's nice. But um, nonetheless, it is uh, back in there. So uh, you can find me there Thursdays from 4.30 till 5.30. Um, and by appointment, if you need to meet with me, I will come in and um, we will meet. If it's absolutely unmanageable with childcare or um, snow or something along those lines, um, I'm more than happy to have a Skype meeting with you as well. Um, I've just recently rented an office uh, here in Windsor for the purpose of doing uh, precisely what we're doing here. Um, you can probably hear there's a bit of an echo. I'm just in the process of moving in. You can see I haven't even really painted yet. I've got everything prepped. So, but again, I've got a window. So that's something. Anyway. Um, so, like I said, I'd be happy to Skype meet with you um, if, if um, a face-to-face -face is necessary. Otherwise, email. 
I try to stay on top of my emails, um, and the operative word is try. I'm teaching four sections this semester, so that makes me very busy. And three of those sections are online, so that makes me electronically very busy. Right? So um, right off the bat, I'm going to warn you that I do fall behind. Uh, it's going to be a lot of grading and a lot of electronic communications. Um, that eats up quite a lot of time. So. Um, Anyhow, um, but nonetheless, I will get back to you um, if you have course difficulties or anything along those lines. But always please feel free. My office hours are drop in, office hours come see me. Usually I'm just sitting around bored, right? Getting my own work done. So, um, on to the course. Um, the course description says that it is a study of the main types and problems of Western philosophy. The readings are chosen to illustrate the development of Western thought from the ancient Greeks to the present. Offered every semester satisfies the university uh, general education requirements in the Western civilization knowledge exploration area. You see, the reason I'm reading through the course description in this boilerplate is because this is the box that this course needs to fit in. Right. If I am designing a course, these are the things that the course needs to do, otherwise I'm fairly free in terms of um, course design. So we will be starting at the start point of Western philosophy, um, and in fact this week I'll be posting um, a brief video um, it, it sort of it discussing pre-Socratic philosophy, and pre-Socratic philosophy is exactly what it sounds like. And philosophy before Socrates. Now, um, the, the historical record is sort of spotty um, for that period of time, so what we have is fragments, and we think we know generalized positions. But, um, nonetheless, I think we have enough to build sort of a context in which we can find the character Socrates um, in the early dialogues of Plato um, that we're reading, which are the Apology and the Credo. Right? So you will find a, a character by the name of Socrates in the Apology giving himself a trial defense and in the Credo um, giving an argument with regard to duties and justice with regard to a democracy. I don't want to give away too much. It's like giving a Game of Thrones spoiler or something along those lines. But nonetheless, um, it, that is what we will be discussing um, right off the bat. So we will start, as this suggests, um, from the ancient Greeks. And we are going all the way up to um, as present as present can be. Um, not as present as present can be. Uh, we will be going to about 1889 with a guy by the name of Frederick Nietzsche, uh, which is, uh, is sort of funny in terms of philosophy, sort of recent, right? it, given the whole span of the history of Western philosophy. So um, we will be um, covering spot checking, more like um, about two and a half millennia of um, the history of Western philosophy. So uh, that's what we will, and I will be supplementing with more recent material, um, much of it stemming from my own research um, as well. So, uh, you know, that's, so check, that's, that's item one in um, the, the, the box the course is supposed to fit into. Um, there are also uh, gen ed learning um, outcomes and course objectives. Um, and basically, uh, we have to learn about Western civilization. And these are all Western theorists that um, I have chosen. Which is kind of a bummer because um, I am a little bit on the trained side in Eastern philosophy as well, Buddhism, Taoism, a little bit of Hindu philosophy. This comes from my master's degree at Brock University. Um, so, um, you know, it's interesting. You may see me bringing in interesting parallels um, between Western and Eastern thought, um, which through Athens, where Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were arguing, it was a port city. So, of course, they would be trading with Persia and um, what we sort of loosely define as the East as well. Um, so, of course, the ideas sort of... Uh, I'm not sure this is the best metaphor, but cross-contaminate one another, 
right? It's, I mean, no philosophy grows up in a vacuum, right? The context in which people are making arguments matters, right? So current arguments um, in the history of Western philosophy might 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 involve um, you know propaganda surveillance culture um, the Occupy movement lateral forms of association in terms of activism um, digital forms of democratic participation and the theories of justice that go along with them etc 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 contemporary ethics for example is engaging with problems these guys never had to deal with any of these guys never had to deal with to clone or not to clone right should we edit genetically our children before they come about right and, and popular culture philo follows philosophy as well if you've seen the movie Gattaca or some of the other kind of um, in, in tech movies that are out there they they raise these kinds of concerns as well Elon Musk is completely freaking out about AI and I know a number of philosophers that are working in um, artificial intelligence right because really it turns out that what a brain does or what human cognition does might find something analogous right in this new form of artificial intelligence or is artificial intelligence something that's that's completely distinct is it a distinct form of intelligence that's somehow alien to our form of intelligence and then what do we do about that elon musk i was just reading an article he's predicting world war three brought on by the ai's kind of thing which sounds very terminator but um nonetheless uh, uh, so Anyhow, right? Um, this is this is the kind of uh, conversation that we're going to have all semester. Right? Uh, what 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 do these new developments mean for our theories of justice? What it means to be a human being? What it means to be free? Etc. 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 And we're taking a historical approach to see how these ideas have evolved in the West. Right. So uh, that's that's what we are doing now. Towards the bottom of these learning outcomes, um, what we'll find is that um, there are a few technical skills that we have to. And the more I teach this course, the more I I wind up presenting it as a technician would. Right. So um, I'll just read them all. To introduce um, students to the important historical texts and philosophy, that is, to know the important philosophical ideas um, of uh, Euro European and American culture. So students, texts, texts, students. That was your brief introduction. We'll expand upon that as the semester goes on. Uh, to show students how philosophical theories have developed over time. I've just laid that out, kind of, and we're taking a historical approach, and these theories are developing over time. Each and every one of these theories are in dialogue with one another. So um, that, that will be interesting, right? So um, hopefully um, we will have some interesting thoughts and dredge out some interesting connections between these theorists on these topics. Um, uh, to develop students, faculty, and using logic or reasoning more broadly to analyze and evaluate philosophical arguments. Right? So basically, we're going to be reasoning and arguing and using logic to engage with these arguments. Right? So we're going to be taking a critical approach. Right? At the same time as being generous enough to these arguments to see how they um, it, it, it hang together by an internal sort of structure, right? And evaluate critically, of course, that structure. And then finally, um, and this is largely these last two, the using logic to analyze and evaluate philosophical arguments, and then the final one to develop students' facility and clear presentation presentation of arguments in writing are the main things that. I evaluate. So my job is to introduce you to the texts, to choose texts that show you how uh, these ideas have developed over time um, and in conversation with one another. Uh, but nonetheless, what I assess in you is your ability to use logic or reasoning um, to evaluate these arguments. And 
how you're able to clearly present accounts or critiques of these ideas in writing. Right. So that's what we're doing right, in this course. And right. so uh, why, why should you care about this? Right. Why is it a big deal to be able to use reasoning to evaluate arguments and to be able to clearly present theoretical ideas or arguments in writing? Well, come on, think about it. Right? It, that, look at the culture that we live in. Right? For the most part, we're typing at one another. We're arguing virtually with one another. I mean, the President of the United States tweets, right? And these tweets have an impact. So it's important that we are able to clearly assess right, and communicate in this written form now more than any other time. But bizarrely, our age is one where more people in the world, in real numbers, and in terms of percentages of populations are literate, right? This is how we communicate with one another. This is also how we store for posterity all of our knowledge of our culture, right? In addition to the lived practice of being in a culture, right? So it's important. This is the medium of our age, right? So sure, it seems like I'm dragging out these dusty philosophers for you, but nonetheless, right, the skills that we are learning by cutting our teeth on these philosophers and learning how to communicate argumentatively, theoretically, in a clear kind of way, these are survival skills. Right? These are survival skills. And to a certain extent, is a, I've got a sociologist friend by the name of Paul, his birthday's coming up, I've got to remember that. Anyhow, um, Paul introduces theorizing to his students in a way that I think will all no, pirate. It's okay, I've added a footnote, it's, it's coming from Paul. You know, so much of what we learn at the university is, is a set of technical skills, procedures, that sort of thing. How to follow the procedures, how to uh, do X using method Y kind of thing, right? But eventually, eventually, in your life you are going to hit a point where the systems that you are applying break down or don't work or find a case that doesn't fit within that system and then on that day you're going to have to theorize. Now this course is going to give you a basis in terms of the bare bones structure of how to do precisely that. So on that day when all of the systems break down and you're going to have to independently use your theoretical abstract understanding of the world to encounter a situation right, and to rise to the challenge of that situation, it's best to have some background in how to do that. Again, survival. Right? These are important skills, not to sell it too much, I guess. Now. I'm the jerk that has you buy like a whole bunch of books. There are a whole bunch of books for this course. I try to make them as cheap as possible, but nonetheless, this is your big ugly pile of books right here. Um, and I gotta say, I, you know, there are theories about professors wherein they get these books for free, so don't give a darn what they cost kind of thing. I'm trying to watch my language, I've got two year old kids. Right, um, but uh, no, this this has all come out of my pocket as well. Right now, we're going to start with Plato's Five Dialogues. Um, there are a number of copies of uh, that have these dialogues in them. I think there's one, The Trial and Death of Socrates. Um, there, there are like, that has four dialogues, but it's got four that you know, are important here. I think they drop the Mino, but it doesn't matter. We're not doing the Mino anyway. We're reading two of these dialogues, right? And um, like I say, you should be able to find used copies of this online, um, dirt, dirt cheap. And I think if I go to Abe Books, A-B-E-B-O-O-K-S dot com kind of thing, I think they're under a dollar. Shipping is what gets you. Right. But if you're ordering a lot, 
uh, half the time they wind up giving you free shipping. Right? So this can be dirt cheap, right? but nonetheless, five dialogues, we're reading two of them. I'm trying to keep your reading down um, in manageable chunks weekly, right? because philosophers like to read a little bit really well rather than a whole lot. Right? So unlike an English course where you're reading, 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 can barely keep up with the reading, this I prefer you to sit down and concentrate on a text. Right? So we're only reading two dialogues for the first two weeks of class. Right? After that, we move on to Plato's Phaedrus. Right? This is an interesting dialogue, and um, how long is it? It's under 100 pages, but we're just going to the top of page 49. Um, we're actually sort of misappropriating this dialogue. There are a number of parts to it. Right? Um, so basically what we're concentrating on are three speeches. One by an orator by the name of Lysias, one by the character Socrates, who's basically a hand puppet for Plato. Uh, at this point, this is this is what happens. Right? Um, it, these early, early, early dialogues are thought to be just reportage of Socrates' position, because Socrates himself never wrote anything down. When we turn to the Phaedrus, what we get is Plato using the character Socrates as a literary device to make his arguments. Right. So there are three speeches in here, one by Lysias and two by the character Socrates, which actually relate Plato's position. And uh, this dialogue, if you ever heard of platonic love, right, or Joe and, Joe and Susie dating, no, it's just platonic, oh, that's too bad. Uh, well, this dialogue is about platonic love, and it's not generally what we mean by platonic love. We're going to see what Plato meant by platonic love. Right. And it's actually a fairly interesting, robust kind of position. Um, there are other ways to get the same sort of theories, to sort of meet one another and interact. Right? Other books that I could use, but we'd have to read 110 pages of The Republic right, by Plato in order to achieve the same thing that we can do in 49 pages of The Phaedrus. So that's why I chose this book. And again, the, the, these books are Hackett translations, which are excellent translations that have gone off um, uh, their, 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 their copyright. So they're able to be published really, really cheap. So this book is dirt cheap. Find a copy, buy a copy. Right. Um, I picked these books specifically, uh, partially so that when I throw out a page number, you know what the heck I'm talking about. Um, also partially because these are some of the cheapest good ones that are out there. All right, so try and get these books. And then we move on to Aristotle, or as it's actually pronounced, Aristoteus and the Nicomachean Ethics. You'll see it's a much thicker book, but we are going through books one, two, and three of the Nicomachean Ethics, which is a grand total of, I think, 32 pages. Um, and book three of the Nicomachean Ethics we are just going through book three, section one. So it's two books plus one section. Right. So what we are reading of this big honking book is, um, there are ten books to the Nick McKenna Ethics. We're just reading two in a bit. So it's like that much reading. Right. Now, uh, this is one of my favorite all-around books in the history of Western philosophy. As the title suggests, it's Ethics. Right ethical theory, right? Uh, but at the same time, this can be considered to be maybe the first self-help book that was ever written. Right? So, um, it, because it aims at the goal or end that we all aim at naturally, happiness. Right? How do we make ourselves happy? First, what do we mean by happiness? And secondly, how do we attain it? Right? Aristotle's position holds that the reason why we do everything else that we do, whether it's choose a job, choose a partner, choose a garment, choose an office, choose a car, choose something off a menu for dinner, um, choose to have kids or not, the, the reason we prefer Coke to Pepsi or Pepsi to Coke or do the do instead is because we want to be happy. It's the reason we do everything else that we do that we never do for the sake of anything else, why do we want to be happy? 
question doesn't even really make sense, does it? Uh, that which if we had, if we attained this end or goal, it would be so complete and self-sufficient that we could want nothing else. Well, the interesting thing about how Aristotle lays out this argument is that basically if we want to be happy, the best strategy for that is to be good and decent people. Uh, and we'll take a much closer look at that that argument right, and how it hangs together. I mean, I'm, I'm sure some of you just rolled your eyes at it, but it actually hangs together in a fairly strong way. You're allowed to be critical of all of these ideas too. Um, that's something that, by the way, that's half the course, right? Those three books. Um, and um, it, it, what I want to say is that it, don't try to give me what I want. Two things about that. One, it's not the point. Uh, what I want from you is that you engage theoretically with these ideas, understand what the heck is going on in these texts, and are able to critically assess these positions. So one, what I want is not you giving me what you think I want. Uh, what I want is you to engage in an earnest, thoughtful way with this material and to argue your conscience. Uh, that's, that's what I want, really. Uh, and secondly, if I do this right, you'll never forget and figure out what my position is. Uh, because, again, it's not the point. Uh, so, anyhow. Uh, so that's half the course. Those are your first three textbooks. How the course is laid out is we'll study two books, right? Socrates, Plato. Then we'll have a test. Then we'll move on to Aristotle and then a guy by the name of Thomas Hobbes who wrote a big honk and tone. This is going to be the most reading for the course. I'm having you read chapters 6 to 19 of Hobbes' Leviathan. Um, and there's just no good way around that, right? But, you know, given what I could have asked you to read, it's kind of that much of a book, right? But, um, and 250, 118 to 250. But, um, it, given what I could have asked you to read in terms of the book, uh, that's, that's not a whole heck of a lot. Um, there's a fairly basic argument that I want you to interact with and understand out of Hobbes' Leviathan. This is uh, the world's first really modern political theorist kind of thing who is trying to almost apply a natural scientific understanding to human interaction and human political arrangement. So it's actually a fascinating argument. Um, it, it, it's a fascinating argument that if you're anything like me is going to annoy you right? and you'll chafe against it, you'll want to be critical of it. Um, I will I will point out a couple of ways that modern theorists have been critical of this argument as well. Um, a couple of ways I've been critical of this argument as well. But um, nonetheless, it's, it's a really interesting and important argument in terms of political theory. It relies on the idea of a social contract. It relies on a theory of human nature that has no optimism in it whatsoever, though is not pessimistic somehow either. Right? It, he, he thinks human beings are rather simple creatures, right? but left to our own devices, we would be at each other's throats. So, given that, given the fact that we have no capacity for self-rule, that we need to be ruled right, by some sort of structure of laws and some sort of political apparatus brought about by a social contract, right, this is how to build the most stable society and the kind of society that will actually lead to most of us getting some of what we want as often as possible. And so that's his argument. This book was an interesting one. Um, it basically, the, what you're getting here is not a translation. Absolutely everything else in the course is a translation. This book was written in uh, what was considered to be the vulgar English at a time when as a matter of power for both the church and the state, academic discourse had to be written in Latin. Why? 
because only people sanctioned, authorized, and trained by the state and the church would be able to engage in these theoretical debates and discussions. If that was the case, it was a matter of clamping down on knowledge. Well, Hobbes said, okay, that's stupid. That's not the audience I want to reach. I get to write in English. All right? So this is Old English. You'll notice some odd spellings in here. Um, sound it out. Once you get used to it, it's not so bad. All right? I, I remember the first time I struggled with this text, and, and I found it very rewarding and very interesting, yet at the same time, initially a little bit difficult. Right? Like most things in life, as Aristotle would point out, um, it all depends on practice, on habituating yourself to a new set of behaviors. Right? So, um, it, Hobbes wrote this in English, which got him in really hot water with the powers that be, so he had to run into exile. Right? And the book was committed to the flames. But the argument in the book actually contradicted precisely what the common people of his age were attempting to enact, right? which was limit the powers of the government over the individual, establish what John Stuart Mill later would call liberty, right? some sort of line in the sand beyond which right, the power of the state has no power over the individual. Yeah, these are political liberties, it's just what they are. That's what they were trying, they were trying to establish a constitutional monarchy. And this argument is basically a plain language, written in English, argument to the common people why the common people were wrong. So the common people didn't like this at all, so it was committed to the flames. Um, they planned a plague um, that swept through in, in England. Right? on this book, right? and on top of that there was a fire that swept through London and they blamed this book. It was just its unsavory character. But a few survived, so we've got a copy. That's Hobbes. That's our brief sojourn in modern philosophy. You see what's happened here is a long sojourn, ancient, ancient, ancient philosophy. This is Athens 2,500 years ago. And then we jump to the 17th century. And it's long history of Western philosophy, um, only do so much. And then we hop into the 19th century with the last two figures. Um, this is probably the most expensive book that I have you buy. I've been using it for a long time. Um, uh, there are two, um, two, two, what do you call them? Um, they're not dialogues, they're pamphlets, I guess. Um, that sort of thing. Two arguments um, that I want you to engage from here, right, uh, with from this this book. One is called the concept of anxiety. And the other one is sickness unto death. It sounds very exciting, doesn't it? Right? But these are supposed to be dialogues for uplifting and awakening kind of thing, written by a guy by the name of Soren Kierkegaard. Right. Actually, his name is spelled and uh, pronounced more like Shecha, but we don't do that. It's Kierkegaard, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and in fact, these 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 arguments are written in, by pseudonyms. Right. Um, the, the concept of anxiety, um, Virgilis Hophaesis. Sorry, I'm bad at pronouncing. But nonetheless, this is supposed to be um, the Watchman. Right, kind of thing. Um, you see what Kierkegaard does every time he wants to take up a perspective from which to argue, he creates a whole persona. Right? Well, if I were the type of person who would argue this, I would argue it this way. Right? So he creates a pseudonym who actually, and they're all edited by Soren Kierkegaard. There are a couple that are actually authored by him, right? which are high religious kind of arguments, but right, for the most part they're written by, um, by, 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 by pseudonyms. Um, and this guy is the great granddaddy of ex existentialism. This is where the existential movement starts, arguably. Um, it, and he was a Danish philosopher um, who was very concerned with a trend that we get 
starting with people like Hobbes and Descartes and moving through um, the Enlightenment sort of modernist kind of period. You see, what the modernists like to do is build systems, systems for this, systems for that, systems of ethics, systems of politics, right? That sort of thing. They were great systematizers. Right? But the funny thing is, is that what he noticed when you build a system, what happens to the existing real individual in a context? I mean, you're many of you are first year students at university and you're welcome welcome to bureaucratic system, right? You have numbers, right? Your cogs in a wheel, you're being churned through a machine, it's expensive, you pay tuition, there are all sorts of rules that you've got to learn, all sorts of electronic portals to manage or paperwork to be filled out and that sort of thing. Jeez. Universities have requisition stamps or re requisition forms for staples. The odd thing about those requisition forms for staples is that they must be stapled together in order to be properly submitted. So if you don't have any staples, you can't. You see what I'm saying, right? Is that these systems are built in place with, put in place with the idea of efficiency. And somewhere in that process, the existing individual gets lost. Kierkegaard was very concerned about that, especially with a very systematized, official, Christian religion in his state at the time. You see, officially, when Kierkegaard was writing this, where Kierkegaard was writing this, the official state religion was Christianity. So, by default, absolutely every member of society was a card-carrying Christian. And what did they do? They single-filed into church, they stood at the right moments, They sat at the right moments, they kneeled at the right moments, they parroted back all of uh, the right statements, they knew the words to the songs, and then they went about their days. When you systematize something along those lines, something especially along those lines, something that requires belief and passionate faith, something gets lost. So effectively, what Kierkegaard was doing, uh, well, two things. He was sort of the great granddaddy of modern psychology, as you can, I, these two dialogues are about anxiety and despair, and almost nothing had been written about either anxiety or despair at the time that Kierkegaard was writing this. Right? So these are psychological investigations right, about the problems that Kierkegaard thought, especially in our age, in his age, but even more, he would say, in our age, are going to be the problems of the age. He was also writing in reaction to this over-bureaucratization and this over-systemization of human life, right? where we are all thought to be cogs in a giant wheel. Right? And he's writing from the perspective of the existing individual. Right? So this is the first foray into what we will call existentialism, which is a term that I'll unpack as we go on. Um, and he was a religious existentialist who was very worried about the religion in his day, but thought he could reinvigorate it by discussing these psychological and existential sort of issues with regard to being a Christian. What does it really mean to believe the sorts of things that you claim to believe? How many times in your life have you met people who claim to believe things and act contradictory to those things? And so there's something spiritual that needs to, in fact, happen. Right? You don't need to be I'm not going to be passing a Bible here or anything along those lines. You don't need to be turned off by the term spirit. We, we mean it the way we mean something like school spirit or the spirit of public engagedness, right? right? Or getting into the spirit of the conversation or the spirit of a party, right? There's something dispositional that happens there, right? And so Kierkegaard engages in precisely that. Right. And then finally, 
the last text for the course. This is, this is like I'm, I'm looking at the back of this and brand spanking new. It's 14 bucks. All right. I have an old copy here, so your copy won't have the same color. Actually, if you go up real close, your copy will likely just have that guy's face um, rather than the big sort of cloudy whatever kind of uh, the mountain scene. Right. But nonetheless, this is this is an old new to me copy because my old copy had like literally fallen apart. Um, this is a guy by the name of Frederick Nietzsche, um, and we are reading uh, the extremely cheery dialogue or dialogue book, right, written very very late in his career, called Twilight of the Isles or How One Philosophizes with a Hammer, kind of thing. Um, this is another one of the proto-existentialists at work here. And so you see what I'm doing. Kierkegaard, religious existentialist. Nietzsche, if you don't know anything about Nietzsche, you should know this. He's famous for the claim, God is dead. Which wasn't his claim, that was actually a guy by the name of George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. But nonetheless, he was, it was attributed to him. Um, effectively, he's concerned about something structurally similar to what Kierkegaard was concerned about. We no longer have the courage of our convictions. Twilight of the Idols. The idols are beliefs and dogmas of our age that we keep parroting and keep sort of enacting, yet we don't have any sort of conviction or faith right, in. Now, unlike Kierkegaard, who thought that these beliefs and systems of belief could be existentially re reinvigorated, Nietzsche thought a lot of these systems were run to the core. So what we're going to get is a critique of these idols or beliefs or dogmas, right? and a rather systematic one at that. Right? He's going to be very critical of Christian morality. He's going to be very critical of Socrates, who we'll make quite a lot of fun of. Uh, he's going to be very critical of Plato and another philosopher by the name of Kant. Right? Um, and he's going to present sort of a quizzical kind of position. And I've got to say, Nietzsche is the first philosopher that ever made me, while reading him, laugh out loud. Which is important, I tend to think. Uh, now, why did I have you buy six bloody books when you could have just gone out and bought well, one big honkin' Philosopher's Way textbook with bullet points and answer keys and like little oh by the way sections and stuff like that. Well, I do this for a few reasons. One, if you want to learn about Plato, I tend to think that you should read Plato. Right? Not, um, who is this even? Uh, John Schaeff, right? And his discussion of Plato. You've already had my discussion of Plato. Right. But nonetheless, at least if we're having a discussion about Plato, we can go back to the primary text and say, didn't Plato really argue that? What do you think he meant by that? Maybe you're interpreting it. We're going to be developing a facility for critique and evaluation, right? yet also for interpretation. Right? So, right, I don't want to interpret an interpretation of an interpretation of material. Why, why, don't, why don't we go see what Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, um, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Hobbes had to say about this and have a conversation about that. Secondly, these are really expensive. Right? They're really expensive for you. You see what this is? It's an examination copy. I get them for free. They want me to order these kinds of books. And this has an edition. This is the third edition. I think they're on like the sixth edition now. So that, you know, if you've got the third edition, it's no good anymore. Right? The chapters are different. The sections are different. Page numbers don't fix. They've changed the interpretation, that sort of thing. So you have to buy the brand bloody new one. Right? I, these books don't change. Right? What Kierkegaard said is just what Kierkegaard said. What Plato argued is just what Plato argued. It's there in black and white, that sort of thing. We can have a conversation about that. You get to buy used copies rather than the seventh edition of 
these additions are crazy too. And I think this edition is vastly superior to previous editions because spelling and grammar were corrected in three places. Plus, we moved the chapters around so your page numbers don't work. Right? So, I, I tend to like doing it this way. And it, I think if you compare price-wise, what I've asked you to do, even though it's a lot of books, is much cheaper. Plus, you start building a fairly decent library. Right? At the end of the day, if you're into that. If not, sell the books back so that my students in the future get used copies of them. Either way, it's cool. So those are our books. So like I say, um, Socrates, Plato, test. Aristotle, Hobbes, test. Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and then the course is over. Okay. That's what we are doing. Uh, the grade breakdown is three tests for 30% each for a total of 90. Right. Now that means your tests are actually a huge weight. Right. So the first test, that's 30% of your final grade. Right. Um, it's typically going to be six questions worth five points each. I typically give you, how long did I give you um, with these tests? Uh, long bloody time, I think. Uh, section test one uh, will be posted to Moodle on October 4th, and then it's going to be um, due October 9th. So I give you a good five days with this material. So you know what that means. You've got your books. You've got the videos that I post for you. You've got your notes that you take when you watch the videos that I've posted for you. Um, you've got, interestingly, discussion forums, which is an ongoing conversation about the material with your fellow students who are in need a sip. And if you're really stuck, you've got me. Right? You can contact me about this. Right, so, and you've got five days, right? Um, it's Wednesday, October 4th. I have office hours on Thursday. Give the questions a look. If you want to talk about them, I've got office hours that day. Come talk to me, right? So um, that's how things are going to be laid out for this course. You're going to be submitting single files for this test to Moodle. Um, I'm toying around with the idea of a submission statement about academic integrity and that sort of thing that you'll have to click OK to and make sure your submission is finalized to Moodle. Um, there are tutorials on Moodle for this. Right? If you get into um, trouble, I think e-learning and instructional support can help you out with all of this. Um, so, uh, otherwise, each of the theorists that we'll be discussing will be um, accompanied by a discussion forum, uh, a topic that I'll type out for you, a topic that I'll introduce to you with a brief video about why I think it's an interesting topic for discussion. And it, like, you know, it, it was it, it, it all, it, some critical or theoretical point um, it, it raised by, by Socrates in the Apology or something along those lines about why voting is not sufficient to maintain justice in the context of democracy according to Socrates. I'll introduce it. You'll have an ongoing conversation about it. These forms are 10% of your grade, so that adjusts your grade a full letter kind of thing. I've seen people slotted to get A's in the course, get B's in the course because they just didn't bother with the forums. You know, I've seen people wind up with C's rather than B's. Um, I've seen people fail rather than pass the course because they didn't do these forums. The forums are great for a couple of reasons. One, it's rough workspace right, where you can pretty much cut your teeth in plain language, interpreting and dialoguing with one another about this material. Right? So it's practice for your tests. Two, right, you're engaging with the same material before the test that you're going to be tested on later. Right? You'll see, frequently I bring in themes from the forum discussion into the test. Right? So to a certain extent you'll have 70% of one of the questions, two of the questions likely, already sort of answered. All right. So that'll leave four. It's no big deal. You can, you can do four, especially since you've got practice having done it. 
Three, the forums do not end with my topic question. The forums are great places if you're just stuck on your reading or trying to figure out what the heck these guys are talking about. You see this hairline? This comes from what are these guys trying to say? That's where it comes from. Right? It's I'm not I'm not choosing these theories, these texts, these arguments because they're easy. I'm choosing them because they should challenge you. Right? Because I think you can do it. Right? And the idea is that your capacity should increase as a result of taking this course. Right? So these forums, three, right, are great places to work out the nuances of these theories along with your fellow classmates. Right? So if you're stuck, the forums are a great place to say, I, I really don't understand what Aristotle's arguing in Book 2, Section 4. Right. Can somebody help me interpret this passage, quote passage, I think it might be this, but any help would be much appreciated, or something along those lines. That's a great way. And then finally, you get points for asking questions. You see, on the test you have to have the answers, but on the forums you can just ask a question and you get points for it, and that's completely valid. Um, forums, I don't care if you start a new topic or respond to somebody else's topic. Right? You don't have to do both. Right? You can do either or. Right? But um, I track both. You get points for both, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, that's the idea. Um, so, those, those, that's where your grades come from in the course. Right? Three tests, 30% uh, each, that's six questions at 5% kind of thing. These are substantial questions too. I typically ask you to explain an idea and make a distinction or something along those lines. Right? So um, the questions will be questions that you'll have to think carefully apart, break down into their parts and make sure that you're ans answering completely kind of thing. The sentences, paragraphs, that sort of thing. Remember back on the first page where it said you had to learn how to write? Well, uh, in order for that to occur, I've got to have you write. Now, I've got to read what you wrote, and I've got to make sure it's clear, and I've got to coach you a little bit with regard to your ability to write about abstract ideas. Right? So, um, that, that, that is just what I'm supposed to do. Like, the, the, it's my job, right? So I have no choices. It's the box the course has to fit into. That's the tests. And then the forums is like practice time for that. And um, the idea with the forums is that um, it, your post should be substantial, your post should be timely, your post should be frequent, right? Um, so posts like, I agree, or this is stupid, with no additional qualification. I When I'm reading through this, I'm, I'm looking for you know, signs that you've read the material and are trying to understand the material. Uh, signs that you are listening to arguments and thinking through them as you're responding to them. Right? So um, these are the sorts of things that I'm looking for with the forums. Um, the interesting thing with the forums, I leave them open all semester. They close December 13th at 11.55 p.m. That's five minutes to midnight, the forum. So uh, like next week when Socrates goes up, it's going to stay open all that time, right? So conceivably, you could do the forms later in the semester. That's a section of your grade I like you to have control over right up until the end, right? But I notice if everybody is December 12th and 13th doing all of the forms, that'll be reflected in your grade because really the spirit of the thing, there's that word again, Right, is that this is supposed to be one long-running conversation amongst yourselves about the material. I post very infrequently. Other good ways to interact with these forums include examples that illustrate. Right, uh, You'll see in me, I explain things using Kung Fu Panda and Curious George these days. I've got kids, it's just what's on. Right. You know, it doesn't have to be highfalutin kind of examples. I'm not asking you to engage with avant-garde theater in order to tease out ideas or anything along those lines. Right? Bizarrely, Bugs Bunny is 
an interesting philosopher of his own right, in his own right, uh, or can be, if you read him with a, from a certain angle, right? So, um, you know, use examples from your life, and something your little brother or sister was saying the other day, right? Something that happened at work, right? So, it, these are good ways to engage. Um, minimally, you should post once for each of these, these forums. And a quick note about minimums. If I'm saying minimally, I'm telling you how to get a C minus. Right? Do more if you want more. Right? Don't just do the minimum. Right? So uh, that's forms. If you have any questions, let me uh, know about that. Um, I have a discussion board, uh, forum content policy as well. Um, the idea is uh, keep it topical, keep it classy. Right? Questions about the course, question, uh, conversations about your weekend, um, it, pleasantries, niceties, that sort of thing should be on the forum. This is an academic resource. Secondly, given that it's an academic resource, it's essentially public to the course and the code of conduct kicks in. Right? So it, I will accept no and tolerate no defamatory, derogatory, um, ad hominem sort of attacks, right, on um, this, this, this forum, right? Posts of that nature will be removed and sanctions will be applied. Right? In severe cases, it may go to the Dean of Students office. Right? So the idea is keep it on topic, right? The Socrates forum is for discussion of Socrates, for example, right? And keep it classy. Remember that you're having an argument about ideas, not an argument with a person. Right? So attacks against people are completely unacceptable. Right? So anyhow, that's that's the forums. Classy, topical. Right? Okay, and the tests. All right. Um, I've already gone over um, much of what's going on in the tests. Like I say, sentences and paragraphs. Point form responses are useless um, because I have to interpret a point form response and the idea is that you're supposed to be communicating clearly and effectively about ideas and, and relating arguments. And so if I have to interpret in an extreme kind of way what you're saying, I have to do too much to point form in order to make it mean something. Believe me, I've got my own point form notes that I have to interpret too much for to, right? So, sentences, paragraphs, right? And generally, I say a minimum of one paragraph, right? Then I define what a paragraph is, right? The idea is if you want more than a C minus, do more, right? It's probably two paragraphs of response. I ask you to do two things in these questions. Paragraph one, first thing you're doing. Paragraph two, second thing you're doing, right? That sort of thing. These will be substantial. You're going to be writing a lot. You're going to have to plan your time accordingly, right? So uh, with regard to these tests, the idea is give yourself lots of time to engage with them, right? The people that wind up in trouble are the people that have an hour before it's due and type off, you know, three sentences per response, and that's just not going to be enough. I can't see somebody succeeding with that. So um, those are the section tests, right? Um, so um, that's what I'm grading you on. Okay, on to policies. Almost done. Almost done. Um, I've got a big policy on plagiarism here. Um, I'm going to say words on each and every one of the assignment videos about plagiarism, but nonetheless, plagiarism, uh, plagiarizing the work, work of others is when you use somebody else's work or ideas without giving that person credit. Right? I've seen books taken out of libraries for this. I've seen deans fired over this. Right? We like to go, ha ha ha. Kacha plagiarizing, isn't that silly? Slap on the wrist, move on with our lives. No, it's theft. What it is, is theft. And it's theft one, it, it's, it's illegal because there's intellectual property law that governs right, this particular topic. Plus, on top of that, it 
circumvents the evaluation sort of structure for this course. My job is to see what you understand of this material. If what I get is not your words, your ideas, your work, I can't grade what you've given me. I can't. There's just nothing to grade, right? Because uh, you haven't shown me what you know. You, you've grabbed something off the internet or out of somebody's dissertation or something along those lines and slapped it on a page and handed it in as though it's your own. So for this reason, my contract stipulates that I am an adequate judge of your understanding of this material, but contractually, I'm not allowed to determine authorship. You know what my contract says? I have to take the plagiarized material. And frankly, I, I can tell the difference between plagiarized material and not plagiarized material. And it's, you know, I've got a wacky sixth sense for this all of a sudden. It's like I'm like the Spider-Man, bing, bing, bing. Or, as you'll see, Socrates. Socratic daemon chirping in my ear. Right? It stands out like a sore thumb. Right? You might think it's being clever, but no, it's not clever. Right? So what I have to do is take that material and turn it into the Dean of Students office. And then their experts come through and determine whether or not it's a case of plagiarism. And if it's determined that it's a case of plagiarism, severe sanctions up to include and including suspension from the university will kick you out of the school are possible, right? So, um, now I've got a zero tolerance policy on plagiarism, right? Your work should be your own work, right? Um, it, my contract says I just have to take your stuff and pass it on to the people who determine this. But I get to make a course policy, and this is to help you with your cost-benefit analysis. If it's determined that it's a case of plagiarism, well, that's it for the course. That's it. You fail. Right? You just fail the course. That's to start with, before the Dean of Students Office and the Academic Review Board get started. Right? And they have a whole litany of possibilities that they can... And so the idea is finger wag, finger wag, don't do it. You see, what's just happened here is you, I don't know you at all. Right? You've not done anything, and the fact that I've had problems with plagiarism in the past has put me in a position where I need to accuse you, even though you haven't done anything. I'm sure you're all nice people. This is all moot if I don't have a case of plagiarism. This doesn't apply to you. Please make this not apply to you, right, is what I'm saying. Um, each and every one of the policies that are on in the policy section on page two of your syllabus are there because I've had problems in the past. And so if these don't apply to you, then they don't apply to you. But it's best to have a policy, right? Just so it's up front and you know not to do it or what will happen if you do do it. Right? We're being what a philosopher would call teleological or end oriented about this. You do this, the sanction is that. Right? Um, so that's the first one. And, um, by the way, if you're freaked out about what plagiarism is and how to avoid it and what's required for you, um, of you, um, well, first off, the big quotation from there, there is a footnote. Um, it, I got that just from the student handbook. Right? You can go read it there. Um, the second footnote that's there, if you're unsure how to properly cite your work or what's required uh, from you with regard to this important academic integrity issue, Please avail yourself to the Sitebreak program through the Academic Writing Center, um, and I give you a link. Um, since you're online students, this should be easy peasy for you. This is an online sort of tutorial about how to properly cite your work and how to properly avoid plagiarism. I've done it, and I've done it, right? Um, I've gone through and I learned things. Uh, it was pretty good. Um, I just recently published a dissertation with close to 900 footnotes. That's the thing about, you know, it's, I, I have you buy books for the course. Oakland University's got a big honking library. Um, academics use books all the time. I haven't moved in yet, so I don't have a ton of books here. I usually show people my bookshelves. And, 
These are all, this is all there for you to use. You just have to jump up and down, wave your arms around and say, hi, I'm using this. And just be honest about it. That's the idea. And so, um, yeah, it's plagiarism. This assignment policy, um, I'll do this plain language, you've got the policy right there. I'm the first to understand that life happens. Life happens. I've got twin girls, right? I've got a mother with some health issues. Um, I'm an international commuter. Things happen, right? Your lives are complicated. You probably mostly, most work, right? Oakland's a commuter campus. We're depending on information technology, that sort of thing. I get life happens. Sometimes the systems we depend on don't work. And I'm more than happy to work with you. But I have to have a policy about this, otherwise people take advantage. In the unfortunate event that you miss an assignment due, a due date, due to serious illness or death in the family or your dog dies or something along those lines, I had a cat pass away and I took a week off school. Right? These things, these things happen. I get it. Right? You have to notify me. Right? Extensions or late assignment submissions. This is a conversation that we've got to have. You have to notify me, preferably before the due date. We'll work something out. Right? Or within 12 hours of the due date or deadline. Otherwise, I can't offer an extension. The reason that that is there is frequently I would have people start a course in the fall. Uh, you know, beginning of October is your first assignment. Um, you know, beginning of December, I would get an email from this dude. No, oh, by the way, I haven't written the first test yet. When can I do that? But you, you cannot, right? Is the thing, right? Because I pass out an assessment key. Right? Everybody else in the class has had their feedback, right? And it's a horrible way to go through the course because this material builds upon itself and you need the feedback. That's, that's why you haven't just gone, if the course is expensive, the books are comparatively cheap, right? You just want to read the books, go out and buy the books, right? You're taking the course because you also want the instruction and the university credit, right? But please, if, if life happens, you'll find me very accommodating. I get it. I get it. Right? But you just have to work with me if you want me to work with you. Okay? All right. Assignment submission. It's your responsibility to make sure I get it. Right? Um, and there are a couple of things that tend to break down. Right? You're new to Moodle, that sort of thing. It, you want to make sure that you, it maybe, maybe you don't know how to use Moodle and you don't know how to submit an assignment there, right? It's on you to make sure I get your assignment through Moodle. And it's just, it, you know, um, I once I have it, I've got responsibilities. Your responsibility is to get it to me, right? If you're worried about Moodle, if you're worried that Moodle is buggy, there's my email address. Email me a copy of your assignment. That way you're sure I've got it. Second way things break down, right? Make sure I've got the final, complete, and correct document. Your English homework will not be an acceptable submission for your first test or any of your tests. Right? And so frequently, it's it's I open that it's it's Phil one hundred one or uh, Phil eleven hundred now I guess um, the, the, the test one kind of thing. I open it up. And it's an analysis of Faulkner, right? Well, I'm interested in that. It, you know, it's an interesting read. To, 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 I like Faulkner, kind of thing. It just it doesn't it doesn't address the questions I asked about Socrates and Plato, right? So it's your responsibility to make sure I get the right file and that I get the file, right? That's that's just what has to, and that's why you shouldn't be doing this at the last minute. I give you a lot of time. Make use of that time. Right. So uh, that's the idea. Right. And if something happens, let me know and we'll sort it out. Right. So assignment submission. Um, email. A couple of things about email 
sometimes my wife emails me from the next room and I don't get it for four hours. It's not like a text. I don't get it immediately. Right. Um, oh, and by the way, no, I'm not giving you my phone number and you cannot text me. Uh, but nonetheless, email, it's not an instant form of communication. Sometimes it just gets lost in the cloud for a period of time and then finally it comes out. Right. Um, the best way, if you want immediate response, is to come see me at my office hours. Right? Because a good typist might type 100 words a minute. I'm talking at about 240 words per minute now, right? So um, <clears throat> that 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 is the the, the, the best way, right? Um, I'll do my best to answer in a timely fashion, but one, three online courses plus an on-campus course, high volume of electronic communication, right? Um, so I I do fall behind from time to time, right? Um, secondly, right, sometimes I have 10 or 15 emails that are all the same question. In those cases, I go into Moodle and I email everyone. Right? That's what I do when everybody gets a response to that question because if I've got 10 of those questions, there are probably 40 people with the same question and that's closing on a third of my students. Right, so. Everybody gets a response to that question. If you don't need it, delete the email. If you do need it, oh, that was handy. Thank you for answering that question, and on you go. The point is, I'm not ignoring you. What I'm just trying to do is be efficient. Right? So um, that's that's the thing. Um, one last thing about email. Uh, Oakland University likes to own things, right? So um, you'll find I'm emailing you from an OU e email address. Oakland University wants all official course correspondence to go through their email server, right? So uh, at oakland.edu is what I am supposed to be replying to. Technically, if you email from me.com or Hotmail or Gmail or something along those, does anyone still use Hotmail? I've got a Yahoo address. Yeah, maybe I'm old. Anyhow, um, <clears throat> If I get an email from an on OU email address pertaining to the course, technically I'm not even supposed to reply to it. You know, it's a funny thing about, it's like Kierkegaard points out about it existing within, within systems. They, they don't seem to care about the individual. They care about supporting the system and how well the system functions, right? So anyhow um, welcome to the system um, get that OU email address up and running and use it for course correspondence um, while we're on that subject um, I, I, I'm going to have all of these forums sent uh, set up so that anytime somebody posts to the forum you get an email about that post to the forum I get them all too and that's how I read them all so um, I read every last one of the forum posts, though I post very infrequently myself. Right? It's your it's your rough workspace. So anyway, that's email, right? Um, and you're likely to get a high volume of emails with regard to this course as well. Um, I've already said um, the discussion cor uh, forum content policy: keep it classy, keep it topical. That's the idea there. Um, and then finally, extra credit. No. There will be no extra credit in this class. I try to lay things out so that you've got a lot of control over your grade right up until the end, right up until the last minute of this class. That's 10% and 30%. That's 40% of your grade that you will have control of right up until December 13th at 11.55 p.m. when the course ends. Um, I'm more than happy to help you through this course, but there is simply not time in a semester for, for extra credit assignments. If I say yes to you, I have to say yes to my, what do I have, um, 75 and 45 and 100 and 120 students because I'm over-enrolled. Um, I have to look at 120 of these extra credit assignments and I don't have time. There's not time in a semester. I'm going to be struggling to keep up with the work as it is. Right? Um, so go in knowing that there is no extra credit right, for this course. There's credit for this course. If you work with me, I'll work with you. Right? But 
no additional assignments, no resubmissions of assignments, no et cetera, et cetera, because there's not time. I, I can't, I just physically don't have enough time. Um, yeah, so that's the course, all right? Um, boo -doo -boo -boo, uh, your due dates, um, your first due date is October 9th by noon. Your second due date um, for um, the test two is November 6th by noon. The third due date, final due date, is December 13th by 11.55 p.m. I try to give you the whole day there. That's within the exam period. Um, I'll try to give you good feedback. Um, I type a lot, right, when um, I look over these assignments, especially for the first one. Um, so you'll know how to improve the next time. I try to be therapeutic with that. If I'm typing a lot, that doesn't mean I'm angry, right? It means I'm trying to help you. Um, uh, and the discussion forums, you will see those popping up um, next week. Right? Uh, this week, um, uh, you, you'll see in the tentative schedule that September 6th um, through the 9th, uh, you'll have the syllabus, which is up now, um, the overview, which I'm giving you, um, and a general historical introduction to philosophy, which will be another video um, shot in my living room, which is green. Yeah. Anyhow, um, that'll go over the pre-Socratic philosophers and give you more of a general introduction to philosophy. Um, for some reason, I made this video very long, but nonetheless, um, that's what we are talking about. Next week, starting September 10th through 23rd, um, the, the book that we're reading is Plato's Five Dialogues, the sections titled Apology and the Credo. Um, you'll have my Socrates video, a video from Rick Roderick, um, an interesting guy. Uh, it, they're old, but they're, they're really interesting, I tend to think. And uh, one other philosophy, A Guide to Happiness, Socrates on uh, Self-Confidence, which is this funny little British philosopher by the name of Alain de Vuitton who shot a bunch of these things for the BBC. Um, it, it, it's, uh, there, there's a metaphor he uses in there that I like and want, um, and uh, it's a good introduction to Socrates, even though he's funny. And, um, so the, a note also about the videos for this course, these videos are required content, right? they're like coming to lecture, and right? this is what we'd be doing in a lecture hall uh, the first day. Right, so if we met once a week, uh, that sort of thing, you'd be getting out halfway early right now. Um, there's going to be a short video um, as well, though. Right, so um, that's the work. So uh, if you have any questions, do send me an email, and have good days, one for each of you. Thank you.